I have several family members who are conservative and I'm not gonna cut them off. And I don't think that's weird. Hey, what's up y'all? This is Jacob. Welcome back to Sunday Yap Session, the show where every Sunday I hop on here and yap at you all about something with some sort of cohesive storyline to carry it all through. And sometimes we do better than others. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to give it a like. That helps me out quite a bit. And if you wanna come yap with me every single Sunday, be sure to hit that subscribe button because I upload at least once a week. Key Lime, <laughs> Key Lime LaCroix today, y'all know the vibes. Let's get into this. So today I wanna to talk about all of the controversy surrounding Chapel Roan and not in like a celebrity gossip tea spill kind of way, but actually analyzing a lot of these really interesting conversations that are popping up in regards to her politics, specifically in the context of being a queer person from the Midwest and grappling with having conservative family members and kind of keeping ties to those connections and kind of my thoughts on that. Because I am also a queer person from the Midwest and adding being black on top of that adds a whole other layer of complexity. And the way that I'm seeing a lot of people talk about Chapel Roan and the decisions that she's making to keep her family around is very interesting to me and it's very telling and I can tell that a lot of you all are coming at this from the lens of not being in this actual situation so I wanted to get into this and talk about this quite a bit. So if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about there was a Rolling Stone article recently that came out that was interviewing Chapel Roan and talking about just kind of her life and profiling her and in it she talked a lot about like her queer identity and her kind of persona that she puts into her music and how she kind of grapples with that in the context of being a queer person from Missouri I believe she's from and how she has a lot of conservative family family members. And so there are a lot of kind of like religious conservative values surrounding her family and her upbringing and kind of how she kind of grapples with that. And in the article, she talks about how she has family members, like I said, that are conservative and she still loves them and they love her and that she's not just going to like cut off her family because of these views. And she still spends time with them and engages with them and things like that, even though their politics do not at all align with her politics. And she's been catching a lot of smoke for that, that combined with the fact that she's come out and publicly stated that she's not going to endorse Kamala Harris because she said that she sees evil and bad things on both sides of the political spectrum and that she does not feel comfortable aligning her brand, her image, and just like the identity of Chapel Roan to a political candidate. And a lot of people have been calling her hypocritical. A lot of people have saying that like she doesn't really truly believe in the things that she said she does and that she's a performative activist and so on and so forth, which I find very, very strange. And so I wanted to talk about this from my personal lens because I am in a very similar situation as her. And similar to her, I have several family members who are conservative and I'm not gonna cut them off. And I don't think that's weird. So I think a good place to start with this is to give you a little bit of background about my upbringing and kind of the household that I was brought up into. Cause I think that'll kind of inform this conversation and give you kind of a perspective on how my situation is very parallel to Chapel Road. So I was raised in kind of like a rural suburban area of Oklahoma, shout out to all my Oklahomies. And I was raised in kind of your stereotypical religious household. I was a member of like the evangelical Methodist church. All of my family went to church every single Sunday. I was very, very ingrained in it, especially when I was like a lot younger. The older I got, I kind of went through like a whole like ex-evangelical deprogramming basically for lack of better words and have no longer like affiliated with that religious identity and haven't been for a while. But that was how I was raised. And so I was raised in a household with like conservative values, Christian values, and like to varying degrees, I feel like my parents, it kind of just depends. I feel like my mom was like more apolitical and she was kind of just there. She was very into like the church stuff and stuff and still is, but she wasn't like super, super political. My dad was definitely much more political and like I remember him like being very against Obama when he was being elected and he was going around town hanging up posters of like him as like the Joker like so <laughs> which is interesting considering he was raising a black child but like we'll get into that another time but suffice to say I was living in a conservative conservative household I definitely remember my mom being homophobic and me as a result being homophobic too when I was younger for like a good chunk of my younger years and having a lot of these conservative ideologies so that's kind of the context I was raised in and then of course the older I got and the more independence I gained and the more unfettered <laughs> internet access I got access to I quickly started kind of like unlearning a lot of these beliefs which I think was pretty easy for me given the fact that I'm black given the fact that I'm queer so on and so forth and I was able to kind of like parse through a lot of these things interesting side note I might make a video about this let me know if y'all want to hear about this I've been thinking about talking about how kind of the alt-right anti-SJW conservative like anti-theism sort of pipeline was very helpful for me and got me out of like a lot of these religious fears while also not leading me down an alt-right conservative pipeline so if y'all want to hear about that like <laughs> my journey leaving the church was very very interesting 
opinion. I definitely was like consuming a lot of content that was the precursor to the red pill alt-right sort of pipeline. But at the same time, I was watching like Lacey Green and Cat Black and a lot of these like progressive thinking like leftist, <laughs> like radical political people too. That's a tangent for another time, but we'll, sometime, maybe we'll get into that sometime because I find that all very interesting. But yeah, so I was definitely raised in a household. And like I was saying, as I got older and kind of more forming my own identity, I was raised in a household where I knew that like the identities that I occupy, the political values that I have, were not going to be in compatibility with the values that my family has. And even to this day now, I don't think that like my family has full, oh, I know that they don't. <laughs> I know that my family does not have full alignment with my political views and we do not see eye to eye on a lot of things. And with all that being said, I'm still not gonna cut off my family. I am not gonna stop talking to my family members. I am not going to cut them off. And some of y'all might think that's hypocritical, but I think this is just like a very common experience as a queer person in the Midwest. I don't think this is that uncommon. I think a lot of people are experiencing this. And I think perhaps maybe it would be different if my family was like outright Trump supporters. I know my mom isn't for sure. I think she's, like I said, I think she's more apolitical at this point. Some of my extended family members, I'm pretty sure they are. A lot more of them are kind of conservative, but like more apolitical. So I don't exactly know like where they lie. I think a good portion of them probably aren't even voting if I'm being completely honest. I know my dad for sure is like on the Trump train, but I haven't talked to him in years and maybe we'll get into that another point. The vast majority of my family members are still conservative, still hold these values, but at the same time still have love for me, still treat me well. I have not really ever had any like overt homophobic moments with my family members. I've definitely been made to feel like odd or feel awkward around being queer and things like that, but like it has never been like overtly hostile. It's never made me feel like super, super uncomfortable. It's kind of just like one of those things that's like subliminal to varying degrees with some of my family members. It is what it is. But alternatively, a lot of my family members have come around over the years and have learned a lot and have evolved politically, especially my mom. And this is why I don't cut people off. I think I mentioned a couple of Yap episodes ago that I was reading this book called The Will to Change, Men, Love, and Masculinity by Bell Hooks. I still haven't finished it yet, but at the beginning of the book, she talks a lot about men and she talks about kind of like historical feminism and not feminism as a whole, but like a small group of people with and feminism who are kind of that like, I hate all men, men are useless, men are not able to be saved, there's no hope. And in the book, she talks about how that's like a really dehumanizing belief because you're kind of assuming that just half the population essentially is incapable of growing, is incapable of changing, is incapable of becoming a better person. And while she's talking specifically about men in the context of this book, I think that's a context that you can kind of extrapolate to this conversation. I think that assuming that all of your conservative family members or every conservative person that you know is in a fixed state and cannot be changed and cannot grow and cannot evolve, cannot learn new beliefs, so on and so forth, is dehumanizing. <laughs> and are there a lot of people that are just kind of stuck in their ways and there are not any sort of conversations that are really going to move the needle? Yes. But I don't think that we can assume that that is everybody. And that is kind of the crux as to why I am not going to just cut off all my family members. And I have seen this work lots and lots of times. I talked about earlier, my mom was definitely homophobic when I was growing up. I don't think she is anymore. And that's because me and her have talked about this ever several, several, several times. And I see my mom as a human being who can learn to change, who can be convinced of different ideologies and can expand her horizons. And that's exactly what happened. I think me coming out was like a big catalyst into that, but we just had several conversations. And I do want to add a caveat too. Of course, this is highly dependent on your family members being like receptive to even having these conversations in the first place. So I am definitely in like a privileged position and I'm not trying to pretend like if you are in this circumstance, this is going to be what happens to you. I am very lucky with my family situation where most of them are kind of pretty chill in the grand scheme of things. And even if they're conservative, at the very least, they will engage me in conversation and hear me out about things. But there are a lot of conversations I've had with my mom. And this was a process like over years, like probably like 10 years. This was not something that happened overnight. But there were several conversations I had with her about like gay people in the LGBTQ community where she had like negative feelings. She felt that like it was against the Bible, da 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 da. And I would just talk to her and be like, well, what does it have to do with you? Are people asking you to be gay? Are people trying to force this lifestyle on you? And just talking to her about how like the vast majority of queer people I know are just trying to live their lives, just trying to be happy. And I think we should be treating them like respectable, kind, loving human beings, just like you would treat everybody. And kind of using some of that like Christian ideology of like loving your neighbor as yourself and stuff to kind of show her the hypocrisy of her ways. And I saw her go from someone who I thought I was gonna have to hide the vast majority of my life to, to someone who I bring my partner to like the house quite a bit. Like she has been very cool with it. She's met several of my partners that are men. It has not been weird. She likes them. They get along very very well, so on and so forth. And it is like a very healthy place. And there's been several other conversations like that about just like political things or social issues or 
stuff like that, where I've been able to move the needle just by like having these conversations and talking to them about that. And I think there is kind of this like sentiment where people kind of expect people to change their entire worldview overnight. And I also don't think that's realistic. And even if you look at yourself too, I think you <laughs> will find this in yourself too, that when it comes to like learning new information or being presented with different ways of looking at the world, it's not like you stumble upon these things and then are suddenly like, oh, oh my gosh, my eyes are open. I believe this fully now. Like I think for everybody, it's some sort of kind of gradual process of learning new things and stepping into new experiences. And I think too, we've talked about, I don't believe in cancel culture. It's not real. Maybe I'll make a whole video about it. But I do think the kind of like online nature of canceling people and just like getting rid of people that you follow because they say something you don't like, which I think is a varying degrees fair. Ultimately, a lot of times social media is entertainment. And if you are following somebody and they say something out of pocket, I don't think it's weird for you to just like unsubscribe and move on. But when it's like people that you're actually in community with, that you actually know, that you actually have time with, and hopefully love too. I think there is this kind of idea among some people that people you're in direct community with should be like that disposable. And if you have a disagreement about something, like the minute there is some level of resistance, you just throw them away. And I think that's dehumanizing too. I am not gonna just throw people in my community away because we do not completely see eye to eye. Now, if it becomes hostile for me, or if it becomes dangerous, or if it just becomes too much of an emotional burden to carry, I think there is a time and a place that definitely to like disconnect. And I've done that with family members before. Like, like I mentioned, I do not talk to my dad. I have not talked to him in years. I have no interest in talking to him because on top of like the conservative political beliefs, he just messed me up <laughs> just by raising me. And I don't really want to get into that. But there is definitely a time and place where like no contact completely cutting off needs to happen. I do not think that needs to be the first resort. I do not think that that should be what you instantly jump to. And I think that's kind of what I'm seeing a lot with this Chapel Roan conversation. I think a lot of people expect Chapel Roan because she is a very publicly and visibly queer, progressive political person, that she should cut all of her family members off and that she should never talk to them again if that's truly what she believes in. And I don't think that that's realistic. And I think that a lot of you <laughs> that maybe believe this, if you looked at your own personal life, you would also see that you are not doing that either. I think we all to varying degrees are in community with people that are not fully aligned with us. And for some of us, you know, it's people that we have to be in community with, like coworkers or your boss or things like that, but also just people you like choose to be around. And I think especially with family, it becomes very tricky, especially for queer people too, because if you cut your family off, a lot of times you are losing access to any sort of resources, support system, or people, like I said, that just genuinely care about you and, you know, may have disagreements or scrutiny about one part of your life. And for a lot of people, that is not going to be a complete deal breaker where people are gonna cut them off. And I don't think that that is an invalid way to live your life. Like the family members I do have that are like that, like I definitely do not engage with them a lot, <laughs> super willingly. I'm not like excited to hang out with them and I usually just see them at like family functions and stuff like that. But like that does not mean that I do not love them and that I do not have care for them, even if they do like weird stuff, like referring to my boyfriend as like my friend. Like my grandma does that a lot. And I'm like, girl, like, okay, whatever. I think the reason that I have a lot of compassion and sympathy for like family members that are like this too, is because ultimately I think a lot of people that are super deep into these like conservative ideologies, or even like I mentioned, like religious ideology or things like that. It is all ultimately in a lot of ways, propaganda, embedded beliefs that have been passed down for a lot of people through like generations and generations. And then there's like political propaganda on like many different sides of the political spectrum. And I think too, it's just important to keep in mind that a lot of people have arrived at the beliefs that they have through a lot of different external sort of forces. And a lot of people like just have not truly sat down to question the things that they believe or have just been raised in environments where everybody believes the same thing. So that's kind of their version of normal or just like a lot of different circumstances. And I don't think that it's completely fair, like I said, to just pass those people off as being disposable and not worth your time and throwing them away. I don't think that that's right. And I think too, if you are somebody who truly believes in your political beliefs and you want to spread them, you are going to work on people. You are going to talk to them about these things over and over and over again. That is how you make change, especially interpersonally. You are gonna to have to talk about things more than once, more than twice, more than 10, 15, 20 times. And I think that's just like the work of having something you believe in and wanting to spread it. I don't expect people to like fully invest in things when I tell them about something new the first time. A lot of times there are things I'm gonna have to work at multiple, multiple times talking with people and helping them unlearn harmful beliefs and stuff. And I think that that's just my conviction. <laughs> and if you are a queer person in the Midwest or any sort of person in the LGBTQ plus community, I would love to hear your perspective as well. Because I think like I'm saying, especially amongst the people I know, this is a very common experience. And I'm very surprised, honestly, that Chapel Roan is getting all of this pushback because 
I do not think this is that uncommon. She says in the article too, that she thinks like a lot of people on like the coast and stuff just really don't have an understanding of this situation because a lot of people are raised in more progressive households where they're not having any kind of grapple with these sort of weird family dynamics. And I definitely think that's true. I think a lot of people are in even like more privileged situations than the situation I'm in. Where like, you know, being gay, being queer was never really like a point of contention. Or if it was, it was never really something that was super ingrained in your family's beliefs. And it was more of just like a, I don't know any gay people. I've never like thought about that really sort of situation. I don't think a lot of people have really like grappled with these situations that a lot of like Southern Midwestern queer is gonna have to deal with. And it's very telling based on the online responses. But like I said, I would love to hear what you all think about this. So let me know below. There is probably so much I could kind of talk about in the grand context of this, but I think I want to leave it there. This is definitely a conversation that has so many tangents and so many ways to go about. So we're going to call it here for now, but I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Hope you enjoyed this episode and hopefully you learned something new or maybe thought about a new perspective of thinking about all of this. Like I said at the beginning, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like. That helps me out quite a bit. And if you want to come yap with me every single Sunday, be sure to hit that subscribe button as I'm here yapping every single single Sunday and sometimes more with my bonus videos that I upload throughout the week and stuff. I'm going to go enjoy the rest of my day and I hope you are having a nice lovely week and I'll catch you in the next episode.